right, well, thank you all. Thanks for coming one more time to listen to me prattle on about my favorite man, Robert Todd Lincoln. And to the winner of the gift certificate, my books are for sale in the gift shop. <laughs> Just to remind you. <laughs> all right, well, on October 15th, 1869, Mary Lincoln, the first child of Robert and Mary Harlan Lincoln, was born. At that moment, Robert assumed one of the most important roles of his long and very eventful life, that of a father. Robert adored his wife, and he was very excited, of course, about his first child. His mother, Mary Todd Lincoln, wrote, my son and his wife right now, that they are more in love with each other than they have ever been before. She wrote that about six weeks before the birth of their child. As the birth approached, young Mary told her mother-in-law that she never imagined such devotion as she receives from Bob. The Lincoln's first child was born after eight hours of labor. Robert informed his mother of her new grandchild within four hours after the birth. He informed the man he called his second father, David Davis, a few weeks later. The young lady is as fat and as hearty as one could wish, Robert wrote. <laughs> and he said that his wife had progressed towards her complete recovery very rapidly and is today in all appearance as well as ever. In February 1870, Robert wrote with his typical humor to his friend John Nicolay, said, you may or may not know that I am a happy father, or rather a mother, for my boy is a daughter of four months standing. <laughs> the wife is as well as she can be and the baby is better still. Now, baby Mary was, of course, the third Mary in the Lincoln family. Whether she was named after her mother or her grandmother or both is um, actually unclear, although the evidence suggests to me that she was named after Mary Todd Lincoln, Robert's mother. But because of the common name and also the Lincoln family propinquity for nicknames, the girl was called Mamie. Now, the Lincoln's second child and their only boy was born in August 1873. And this was, of course, an especially joyous event because back in the 19th century, boys were coveted for being the heir of the family and carrying on the family name. He was named Abraham Lincoln II in honor of his revered grandfather, although the family nicknamed him Jack. Now, exactly why they chose this nickname is also unclear, although there are two main legends about uh, that explain it. The first is simply that Robert disliked the nickname Abe, just as his father really disliked when people called him Abe. But Robert felt that Abraham was too long and formal of a name for a boy, so they simply came up with Jack, <laughs> which doesn't really explain it. <laughs> now, the second story, which is one that actually is told more often, is that Robert believed and he told his son that the name Abraham Lincoln was one to be revered and that the boy could not wear the name until he had earned the right to be called Abraham Lincoln, which Robert would decide when Jack reached the age of 21. Now, this, this latter story has been told very often, but I did find one newspaper article where Robert's law partner, William G. Beale, actually told that story, which to me adds a certain amount of credibility to, to that uh, possibility. But in later years, it was said very often that in looks, in temperament, and intelligence, that Jack was practically a reincarnation of President Lincoln. And people often said that he looked just like Abraham Lincoln, which of course, if you look at a photo of him, he doesn't at all, <laughs> not at all. He's pure Harlan in looks, I think. But you know, people like to connect him to, Abe, to uh, President Lincoln, so see, I just called him Abe, even I do it. <laughs> so after Jack's birth, Robert and Mary Lincoln had two children, Mary and Abraham Lincoln, named after Robert's parents. The Lincoln's third child, Jesse Harlan Lincoln, was born in November 1875, right in the midst of when Robert was dealing with his mother's commitment to Bellevue Place Sanitarium. Jesse was named after Mary Harlan's grandmother, and in later years, Jesse would become the wild, unruly Lincoln child that caused her father much embarrassment and many headaches, which I will explain shortly. But you know, the Lincolns were a typical family of their time. Mary Harlan. And she didn't go by Mary Harlan, but I call her that so we can all figure out who I'm talking about among the four Marys. Mary Harlan stayed home and raised the children. And Robert, of course, he went to work every day. He attended to his business and his politics. 
The children called him Papa, and they called Mary Mama. Robert adored his children, and he spent as much time with them as he could, but he was often away from home. He worked every day at his law office. Typically, he got to the office at 8 a.m., and he worked until about 6 p.m., which were hours he kept his entire life. He often traveled for work, usually to Washington, D.C., or New York City. And then starting in about 1875, going all the way up to 1896, Robert often traveled quite often for politics and uh, especially campaigning for Republican candidates. And Robert also belonged to numerous social clubs in Chicago and in other various cities. He belonged to golf clubs and fishing clubs, and he spent many nights and weekends also in this, uh, you know, quote-unquote, man's world which was rather typical of the time as well. Now, Mary Harlan Lincoln also traveled frequently as the children were growing up, and she nearly always took the children with her. Mary was, like her own mother, a perpetually unwell person. She and her husband and various other people, they always termed her an invalid, especially in newspapers. She was always sick. And so to recuperate, she usually traveled to Mount Pleasant, Iowa to stay at her parents' house the Harlan home. She also traveled to Colorado Springs, Colorado frequently, where the Harlans also had a home. And then whether Mary was well or unwell, she always took Mamie, Jack, and Jesse for at least a part of every summer to Mount Pleasant, Iowa, so that the kids could see their grandparents and spend time in the town in the home that Mary herself loved. Now whenever Robert, or whenever the family was away, Robert stayed in Chicago. He had to attend to business. He worked all week. And usually every weekend, or every weekend that he could spare, he would travel to wherever the family was and spend time with them. One of Mamie's friends later recalled the, just the sheer excitement of the Lincoln family in Mount Pleasant on a Friday morning in 1882 because Mr. Lincoln would be arriving by train later in the afternoon so that he could spend the weekend. Now such a familial relationship may sound a bit disconnected to us today, that Robert spent more time on business and politics and social activities, but it was quite common back then. You know, in fact, Abraham Lincoln, as I've said before, he was typically gone uh, at least six months out of the year riding the judicial circuit, and Robert was raised mostly by his mother Mary, which is one reason the two of them had such a close relationship. And so for Robert's children to be brought up in this way um, was very similar to his own in that sense. But this new generation of Lincolns were reared completely opposite from Robert in the sense of their behavior. Now it is well known that Abraham and Mary Lincoln had absolutely no sense of discipline with their children. You know, Abraham Lincoln liked to say, um, it gives me pleasure that my children are free, happy, and unrestrained by parental tyranny. And of course, other adults just thought the kids were little brats. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, stories of the shenanigans of William Tad, of the outrageous acts that they did, um, they are legion. One of my favorites, since we're all adults here, so I'll tell the story. Uh, William Herndon, he hated it when the kids came to the law office. And he often said, you know, the boys would come, they would pull out books, they would throw papers around, they would upturn ink wells, they would trash the office. And one of my favorite quotes, he said, Mr. Lincoln loved it. The boys could shit in his hat, and he would think it was a great joke. <laughs> that is a direct quote. He actually wrote that in his book. <laughs> but, you know, even though Robert, he acted that, that exact same way as a child, even though people don't realize it, but he was exactly that same way. But as he grew older, he changed. And he even objected to his brother's lack of discipline, going so far one time as having a great argument with his father in the White House about some of Tad's behaviors. Now, I, I attribute Robert's differences to mostly his uh, college years in New England, which really turned him into the uh, quintessential Victorian-era gentleman that he was, and became, and stayed his entire life. And Robert and Mary were actually a quintessential Victorian-era couple. They raised their children in this way. The children were raised to be quiet and respectful and polite. You know, the typical seen and not heard. Minnie Chandler, one of Mary's good friends, wrote in 1881, Mary, do you realize what lovely children you have? Mamie is a most fascinating little woman with her hearty, cordial kiss. And Jack, I look at him with perfect astonishment. 
seated straight in a chair with his feet down. My three young men behave very differently, let me tell you. Jessie, what a sweet, shy, graceful manner she has. Now, of course, Mary Harlan was raised in this respectable manner, but, you know, why was Robert so different? And I think uh, not only his years in New England at school, but also I think, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people see what they think are faults in their parents or mistakes and try to correct for those, which I think could be another reason that Robert raised his children so differently from the way that he was raised. And Robert's personal letters during these years that his children were growing up often included information and stories and little vignettes about his children, such as in 1870, when he told his friend Edgar Wells that six-month-old Mamie gets fuller and fatter every day and is immeasurably proud of her one tooth, which stands solitary and proud like a lonely sentinel in the mammoth cave. <laughs> in 1881, when Robert was Secretary of War, Mamie was 12, Jack was eight, and Jesse was six, Robert bought them their own pony and cart, which they were often seen riding all over the streets of Washington with. Mamie and Jack quickly became friends with President Garfield's children, and uh, it was the first time really since the Lincoln family that children were running about and having fun in the White House. In 1889, Robert wrote uh, you know, a typical little vignette of how he had asked his son to clean the snow off the roof of their house, and uh, Jack broke the gutter, and so he needed it to be fixed. Now, when Robert was Secretary of War, Jack was often found in the War Department office, and Robert more than once brought his son with him to various um, events, uh, to view ships, view forts, do various uh, official duties. Robert, at one point, arranged for his young daughter, Jessie, to christen a new naval ship in 1884. But the bottle of wine that she was supposed to break over the prow of the ship was decorated with very pretty red, white, and blue ribbons. And so she thought it was so pretty that she actually refused to break it. <laughs> and she clung tightly to her chest. And a quick-thinking sailor grabbed a pail and dunked it in the water, and he christened the ship by tossing it on the prow. So, and uh, the newspaper article is great, it said, and, and uh, the young little miss brought it home as her prize of the day or something like that. <laughs> Now, also around this time, uh, Robert, who was an avid fisherman, he named his boat at his fishing club in Pele, Ontario, the Jesse, in honor of his youngest daughter. And the Lincolns were a very happy family, and Robert was very satisfied with his life in Chicago. But when President Benjamin Harrison nominated Lincoln to be minister to Great Britain in 1889, one of the main reasons that Robert accepted the position was the chance for his family to live abroad and for his children to be educated in European schools and experience European culture. But Robert especially saw this as an opportunity to prepare his 15-year-old son, son, Jack, for the future. Now, Robert adored, of course, all of his children, but Jack was, again, his only son. He was his father's namesake. He was, uh, you know, the apple of his father's eye, more or less. And um, as I said, the Gilded Age was a time when boys were reared to follow their fathers into business, into politics. The girls were reared to become wives and mothers. And Robert was already grooming Jack to follow exactly in his own footsteps, do his preparatory work at Phillips Exeter Academy, go to <coughs> college at Harvard, maybe law school at Harvard, join the Isham, Lincoln, and Beale Law Firm in Chicago. And Robert saw the family's four years in London as the perfect opportunity for Jack not only to study in London, but also to study in France and learn the French language. Robert himself was fluent in French, and he conducted a lot of business in that language, and he believed that being multilingual was an important talent for a lawyer to possess. But Jack did not want to go to London, actually. He did not want to leave his friends or the house or the town of Chicago that he loved. But Robert obviously assuaged his son and convinced him otherwise. On their cross-Atlantic trip, one of their fellow passengers on the City of Paris ship recalled that Jack was enjoying himself immensely and, uh, quote, he frequently spoke to me about the good times he anticipated having in England. At the end of the summer of 1889, the Lincolns traveled to Versailles, France, to accompany Jack to Madame Passa's very fashionable school where he would study French alongside the sons of other very famous and 
wealthy Americans uh, such as U.S. Senator Eugene Hale, who was also a good friend of Robert Lincoln's. Now, in early November, Jack cut his arm, although the wound was apparently innocuous. Robert went to visit.